Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to my talk about Buildroot. So today I'll be uh, presenting what's new in Buildroot. My name is Thomas Pelazzoni, and I work for uh, Bootling. Um, so to introduce myself, I am the Chief Technical Officer at Bootlin. We are an embedded Linux services company based in France. We do a lot of uh, embedded Linux development in the area of bootloader, Linux kernel drivers, Yocto project integration, buildroot integration, um, complete Linux BSP development. So we do both engineering services but also trainings and all our training materials are fully available online. Uh, maybe a lot of you have already uh, came across our training materials already. I happen to be one of the co-maintainers of Buildroot, a project I've been contributing to for the past 10-11 uh, years now, and I'm living currently in Toulouse in the southwest of France. So before we get into the, the, the actual topic of what's new in Buildroot, let's review a little bit what Buildroot is actually. It is an embedded Linux build system which allows everyone to build from source code a cross-compilation toolchain a root file system with pretty much as many libraries and applications as you want, which are all compiled using cross-compilation, so you can leverage a fast build machine uh, to build a Linux system for your relatively uh, not very powerful uh, uh, target. And it also allows you to build, of course, a Linux kernel image and as many bootloader images as you want, such as uBoot, Bearbox, Grub, or other bootloaders. It allows to build um, a system that is simple in a relatively small amount of time, so our default configuration can build can build in a few in a few minutes, and it's easy to use and understand thanks to the use of kconfig, which is the same configuration system as the one used in the Linux kernel, and the use of make for describing all the uh, internal logic of Buildroot and how to build the different packages. It allows to generate very small root file systems. Our default uh, root file system is only 2 megabytes in size. It contains just BuzzyBox and a C library. Of course, you can add up many more packages using the more than 2,500 packages we have, but at least the default uh, is minimal and small. We uh, generate only file system images, not a complete distribution with binary packages that you can add, remove, upgrade on an individual basis. We really only generate file system images. We are a vendor neutral project, we don't have any single company behind, uh, behind us. It's really an open source community developed project which has been around for a long time. We started in 2001, so it's probably the oldest in maintained embedded Linux build system. The community is very active, as we will see in some of the next slides, and we ship stable releases every three months. If you want to learn more, of course, bidwood.org is the place to go. So today uh, we're going to discuss what's new in Buildroot within the last two years. It's kind of a talk I give regularly to update the, the embedded Linux community about what's changing, what's improving in Buildroot. So we'll be covering what we have improved in Buildroot since uh, the release 2018.05 to the recently released Buildroot 2020.05. And more specifically, we'll review some community activity metrics, uh, the release schedule, some architecture support changes, some tool change support improvements, package infrastructure improvements, improvements to our dual infrastructure, some interesting package updates and additions. We'll talk about reproducible builds, about top-level parallel builds, and also some important tooling improvements that we've made over the past two years. Um, so start uh, with the activity of the community. This graph shows the number of commits per release, and we do one release every three months. Um, so we can see on that slide that the uh, number of commits is pretty consistent uh, from one release to the other. We're uh, between 100, 400, 1,400 and 1,600 commits in every release with a good spike in, in recently. Um, so that's showing a, a good level of activity in the, in the Bitroot community. The number of contributors is also an important metric in every open source community. And here we can see that even in the last uh, three releases, we increased slightly our number of contributors. So we have for every release approximately 120 to 140 contributors, which is nice. And the mailing list activity is also a good metric. We can see it's pretty uh, uh, constant over time as well, with between 2,000 to 3,000 emails per month on the mailing list. So it's a pretty uh, a significant amount of traffic, uh, which is in part due to the fact that we have all patches and review occurring on the mailing list, just like the Linux kernel is doing. Our release schedule uh, changed a little bit recently. So what we already had was four releases a year in February, in May, in August, and in November. 
So we have a three months really cycle with two months of development and one month of stabilization. And this release schedule has been in place since 2009. So we've been doing that for over 10 years now. But what we've more recently added is the, the long-term support release. Every release made in February, so 202 for example, or 2019-02, uh, is going to be supported for one year, which is an improvement over the support we had before, which was just three months when the next release was uh, made. And in these LTS branches, we provide security updates and bug fixes. So this is very useful if you're doing embedded Linux products and so that you can more easily have access to security updates and, and bug fixes. And to achieve that, we have a maintenance branch open for each of those LTS uh, uh, releases. So we started that uh, with 2017-02, so three years ago, and we had 11 point releases for that uh, LTS branch with approximately 800 commits, and then we continued uh, in 2018-02, 2019-02. Uh, each of them had, had between 11 to 12 point releases, which we make approximately every month. And you can see the number of commits uh, increasing as we track uh, better, more and more security uh, vulnerabilities and their fixes. So today, the currently maintained uh, re LTS release is 2020.02. We've already made uh, three point releases with approximately 340 commits done so far, which of course is increasing uh, as we speak and as we uh, find security issues to fix and, and bugs to fix as well. In terms of CPU architecture support, we've added support for uh, RISC-V, 32-bit and 64-bit, obviously a very popular CPU architecture these days. But we also had uh, added support for NDS32, a CPU architecture from China made by NDS Technology, um, and they contributed themselves the support for this new CPU architecture. Support for new variants of existing architecture was added, things like new ARM Cortex core or x86 cores, MIPS cores, R cores, and so on and so forth. And the Blackfin CPU architecture support was removed. It was removed from the upstream Linux kernel, so it of course makes sense to also remove it from Beirut as well. And overall, we have support for a really wide range of CPU architecture, ARC, ARM, ARCH64, CSKY, M68K, Microblaze, MIPS, NDS32, NIOS2, OpenRISC, PowerPC, RISC-V, SuperH, Spark, X86, Extensa, which probably makes um, BuildRoot the build system that has the widest CPU architecture support. These architecture, of, of course, need to be supported by a tool chain so that we can cross-compile code for your, uh, for your CPU architecture. And we have two toolchain backends in BuildRoot. The first one is called the internal toolchain. Uh, this is the backend that allows BuildRoot to build its own toolchain from source. So we haven't had a lot of significant changes there, uh, mainly regular updates. So we've updated GCC to GCC 8 first, GCC 9, and we have patches for GCC 10. So this is coming up soon. We've removed support for older versions of GCC, such as 4, 9, 5, and 6. So this is really our regular updates. Uh, Binutils was updated, and the uh, 3C libraries have been updated as well, UCLipCNG, Muscle, and GDPC, which we all support. Uh, we are doing some really nice uh, testing of these uh, toolchain capabilities using the Toolchain Builder project, especially Roman Nao from, from Smile. is doing a lot of uh, uh, QA and NCI, uh, which allows to test these um, toolchain components and even report bug to uh, these upstream projects. Um, moving forward, uh, the second um, backend we have for uh, toolchain is the external toolchain backend. It allows to reuse an existing pre-built toolchain that you have from your hardware vendor or other third parties. And in there, we added support for more ARM toolchains. Uh, ARCH64 Big Indian toolchain from ARM and Linaro were also added. Since the NDS32 architecture was added and NDS provided a, a toolchain for, for that CPU architecture, we added support for that as well. And we did many updates to other existing toolchains. Another thing we did is allow declaring external toolchains in BR2 external trees. BR2 external is the mechanism that BuildRoot provides to allow you to um, store your own custom packages and recipes and configurations outside of BuildRoot itself to make it easier to update BuildRoot in the future and to more clearly identify what is custom and specific to your project from the mainline upstream BuildRoot. The package infrastructures in, in BuildRoot are really key. They factorize the common logic that uh, describes how to configure, build, and install packages. 
that use some kind of standardized build system. A good example is AutoTools based packages. You build them by doing dot slash configure, make, make install. Uh, but repeating that logic in each and every package that uses the AutoTools as its build system would be a bit annoying and, and difficult to maintain. So we have the concept of package infrastructure in BuildVoot which factorize that logic in a common place. And we are adding more and more of this package infrastructure for new build systems that appear or at least that get support uh, for in, in BuildRoot. So over the past two years, we added support for three new package infrastructure, Golang package, which as the name suggests is for Go-based packages. We added support for Mason package, which is support for the Mason build system, which is becoming very, very popular. And we very recently added a QMake package infrastructure for QMake based packages and QMake is um, the build system used mainly in the Qt world. And of course, we already add support for AutoTools, CMake, Kconfig, Luarox, Perl, Python, Erlang, WAF, and Kano modules. So we're simply extending that with support for more package infrastructure. To illustrate that, I have an example of a Golang package here, Docker CLI, which is the command line tool to uh, communicate with the Docker daemon. And uh, as you can see in this example, we describe uh, in this package makefile how to build that Docker CLI project. So we describe that it is available from GitHub in a, under a given version. It has a certain license, a number of dependencies. And then we have a few uh, variables that describes how to build it. But the, the crux of the logic is built into the Golang package um, infrastructure, which is invoked at the, on the very last line of that example. And this is um, really where all the logic happens and we don't have to describe step by step how to configure, how to build, how, and how to install this package. This is all encapsulated into the Golang package infrastructure. Similarly, uh, another example with libmpd client, uh, which this time is using the Mason build system. You can see that the package uh, makefile is very simple. We don't have to describe how to configure, how to build, or how to install this package. We only have to provide metadata information such as the, the version, the location of the tarball, its license, and a few other things, and that is sufficient for BuildRoot to build this package. Um, our download infrastructure was improved as well. This download infrastructure is um, the um, code in BuildRoot that downloads the source code of the different packages that we are going to build. So downloads the source code for your Linux kernel, for uBoot, for Qt, for all the user space packages or kernel uh, modules that you are going to build. And this download infrastructure already had capabilities to download from, from Git, from HTTP, FTP, Mercurial, CVS, Subversion, and, and others. But one really key thing we changed is the addition of Git caching. So when you're fetching a, the source code for a package from Git, we used to do a complete Git clone, then retrieve the specific version you were interested in, create a tarball out of that, and throw away the Git clone, which meant that each time you wanted to fetch a new version of that same project, such as the Linux kernel, you would have to do a complete clone again, which was very long, uh, bandwidth consuming, and so on. So what we're doing now, we're keeping that clone of the Git repository for every package um, in, in the download cache so that it can be reused for other uh, downloads in the future. And this is illustrated on, on the right side of this slide where we can see for the uBoot um, folder, which is in your download directory, we have the different tarballs. You can see uBoot 2018-11, uBoot 2019-04, for example. And next to that, we have a Git subfolder where we store a Git clone of that project. So whenever you are going to retrieve uh, uBoot releases using Git, it's going to use that clone to avoid redownloading everything. As you can see on that uh, slide, our download directory was also uh, reorganized to have subdirectories per packages. We used to have a flat organization where all tarballs were thrown in, in, in with no subdirectories into your download folder. Now we have subdirectories per packages. Um, another thing that we're doing constantly in BuildRoot is, of course, adding more packages and updating the existing packages. Uh, between BuildRoot 2018.05 and 2020.05, we've added a bit more than 400 packages, which is quite a lot. We've removed a few packages. Uh, but that rarely happens. We remove individual x.org proto packages because they've all been merged into a single project. Qt4 has been removed because Qt5 has been around for long enough. Gstreamer 0.10 has been removed because Gstreamer 1 has been around for long enough. 
In terms of significant package updates, we've added uh, Rust support for the compiler and the cargo package management system. We've added support for LLVM Clang, not yet as a compiler, uh, but as a library that can be used, for example, for the Mesa 3D OpenGL implementation. We've added support for Mender, an over-the-air update system, for OpenGDK, a Java implementation, for the OpenRC init system, which originates from the Gen2 distribution but can now be used in Buildroot instead of SystemD or the BuzzyBox init. We've added support for the OptiOS, which is the um, uh, secure, uh, trusted execution environment that is used mainly on ARM platforms. We've added support for GeoObject introspections, for the Alparmor security modules, and support for a gazillion of Perl and Python modules. Also, as I said, we've done many updates to existing packages. Uh, Qt was updated, x.org was updated, Gstreamer, Wayland, Weston, Kodi, and many, many more. At the bottom of the slide, we can, you can see how many packages have been updated and how many updates we've done. I've counted uh, over 4,000 updates over the past two years to the various package collections that we have in, in BuildBoot. In, in terms of hardening and security, we received some contributions from Collins Aerospace to be able to build the entire um, user space packages with a number of security hardening features available at the toolchain level. So we've improved support for uh, stack protection, we've added support for Railroad and support for buffer overflow detection using the 45 source option provided by some C libraries. And this is now tested in our CIs so that we can verify that as many packages as possible build properly with those different hardening capabilities. We've added a new make target. We have plenty of make targets in BuildRoot because everything is written in make um, to uh, query information about the build or to start the build. And the new target we've added is make show info. It outputs a JSON blurb that provides a lot of metadata about the packages you have currently enabled in your configuration. So it tells you the name of the packages, of course, their version, their license, um, their original location, their dependencies, and many, many other things. And this is really meant to be used uh, by your own tooling um, to analyze what is in your configuration, do some post-processing, uh, verify licenses, uh, verify that the upstream location is still available, any other thing that you might need. So this is complementing some existing analysis tool we already had in BuildRoot, such as make legal info, which is outputting a um, a set of manifests and collecting all the tarballs and all the patches of, of the source code this build root system is building for your configuration to help you uh, be in compliance with the open source licenses. We already had make craft build to generate graphs of the build time or make craft size to generate graphs of the file system size so that you can analyze uh, why your file system is so big and what could be improved and optimized. Another area of effort has been the reproducible builds uh, work. Um, in uh, 2019, we had a uh, Google Summer of Code with Atarva Lele um, working as a student for the Buildwood project, uh, who was mentored by uh, two Buildwood co-maintainers, Arnaud von de Kempel and Jan Morin. And the idea was to um, improve the, the uh, existing support we had for reproducible builds where the goal is to be able to guarantee that if you do the same build two times in a row with the same configuration, same build root version, you get a bit identical result. So build root already had some good reproducibility properties in the sense that when you rebuild a system with build root, we are going to build exactly the same version of the different software components with the same configuration and so on. But we did not yet have something where the result is bit identical. And so the BR2 reproducible option that we have is helping um, enabling more mechanisms to uh, increase the chance that the final result will be uh, fully reproducible at the bit level. It is not perfect yet. There are still areas where uh, reproducibility is, is not there, but we've made good improvements. And especially what this um, Google Summer of Code has allowed to do is to do automated testing of that reproducibility. So in our auto builder infrastructure, we now have some builds that we do twice in a row. And uh, once the two builds are done for the same configuration, we compare the results and we check if they are bit identical or not. And if they are not, we well compare do the differences and use that to analyze the reproducibility issue and hopefully fix them. 
Obviously, not only this, we did um, improvement on the testing side, but this allowed to discover some of those reproducibility issues which were fixed in TAR, GZIP, CPIO, around timestamp issues. We, of course, need more work uh, in this area and contributions are welcome, but there have been some interesting improvements. In my next slides, I have an example of a report that uh, Defoscop is giving us. So we are comparing two tarballs of the root file system generated by Pildroot, and it shows that we have one small difference uh, in this uh, in one file inside that tarball, the app agent pool uh, shared library from the asterisk package, uh, has a small difference in the sense that it contains the um, absolute path to the build directory, which is different from one build to the other. Um, and so that is something we'll have to, to address in this package. It probably shouldn't include in its binary some reference to the absolute location of the build directory. Another area that was really recently improved is top-level parallel build. The goal is to be able to build several packages in parallel. Indeed, until recently, Buildroot was building each package sequentially. So whenever it was building one package, it would use make-jx to benefit from parallelism within the build of a package, such as when building the Linux kernel. But each package, compared to the other packages, were being built sequentially. And uh, this is, of course, a bottleneck in modern uh, systems that have a lot of CPU cores, so we want to be able to build multiple packages in parallel. And we've merged experimental support for this functionality in Buildroot 2020.02. Uh, it takes the form of an option called BR2 pair package directories. What this option does is that it enables pair package build. That creates for each package its own host directory and its own direct target directory so that each package is nicely isolated in its own environment and therefore we can build multiple packages in parallel. So that guarantees that the dependencies seen by the package are always consistent and cannot change during the build due to parallelism. If you have this option enabled, you can then run make minus j4 minus j8 at the top level when invoking the build root build, and that will really build multiple packages in parallel. We still have some limitations. For example, Qt5 does not support that yet. There is already a patch series pending, but it uh, requires some review and effort. We also have issue with the, the package rebuild, package reconfigure, package reinstall targets, which are not working yet but we have some ideas on how to fix that. Um, in this slide, we illustrate the, the effect of a top-level parallel build. In this first slide, we have a given build that is not using top-level parallel build. So we can really see each package being built one after the other. Um, conversely, on the next slide, we have the exact same configuration being built with top-level parallel build enabled. We can see multiple packages being built in parallel and therefore the overall build time being reduced. This configuration was relatively small, but in more uh, practical configuration, we have seen build time reductions of two times or even sometimes three times. So this is really a great uh, feature to reduce the build time. Another area of work was uh, runtime test. Uh, we added an infrastructure for runtime testing in 2017-02. So what we call runtime testing is the fact that we not only build a given configuration, but we also boot it under QMU and verify within QMU a number of assertions. For example, we might start a Python interpreter and run some test case. We might start an HTTP server, verify that it is running and, and replying to requests and things like that. So this is really complementing the auto builder testing we were already doing, but which was already doing build testing. What we're doing now is not only build, but also runtime testing. And since 2017-11, uh, we've added many, many new test cases, and this has become uh, a more uh, usual practice in the Buildroot community to add test cases when new packages are, are being added. So we have plenty of test cases for Python module, per modules, UI modules, especially because for those uh, interpreted languages, most of the problems uh, occur at runtime and not so much at build time. But we also have a, a test cases for a number of other functionalities. Another area of improvement was the tooling for the maintenance of the project. And here we had an, an internship uh, with Victor Huesca as a student working at Butlin with, with me during the summer 2019. And the topic uh, of his internship was to improve the Buildroot maintenance tooling. And more specifically, what uh, we worked on during this internship was use of releasemonitoring.org for tracking upstream releases. 
improving the notifications sent to Beardroot developers in relation to their packages, and improving as well the search capabilities in our auto builder. So I'm going to give more details on these different topics. The um, releasemonitoring.org um, is a service from the Fedora community that tracks a lot of open source projects and uh, tracks their, uh, up, their upstream releases. So it tracks over 27,000 projects. And um, in Beardroot, we have above 2,500 packages. So it is difficult for us to uh, make sure they are all kept up to date with the latest upstream releases. So in Beardroot, we already had a script called pkgstat that produces for us a, a big table where for each package we have um, information about the state of that package, how many patches we have, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. But what we wanted to add is um, having the current version of the package in Beardroot and comparing that to the latest upstream version of that package. So the improvements with the internship were uh, to add a lot of mapping between Beardroot packages and release monitoring.org uh, packages. Indeed, the naming is sometimes slightly different, so we had to accommodate for that. Um, we made some fixes to um, uh, Beardroot packages so that the, the package version would match better with what upstream is using. We've added a JSON output to PKG stand so that we can do more tooling around it. And we've also improved significantly the speed of PKG stats. This uh, release monitoring.org site um, looks like this. So we can see here the BuzzyBox project um, and all the releases that were made over time. So it is regularly pulling uh, the BuzzyBox.net website to see if there are new releases. And at the uh, bottom uh, left, we can see the mappings which is a feature of releasemonitoring.org website that allows its distribution to document what is the name of the, the package corresponding to BuzzyBox in their distribution. So for example, for Buildroot, the package that we use to build BuzzyBox is also called BuzzyBox, but there are a number of cases where we have uh, differences between the releasemonitoring.org name and the name used in Buildroot. Uh, another uh, thing we added recently is um, CVE checking. Um, the idea is uh, this time not to make sure that we are up to date with the latest upstream release, but that we don't have any um, known CVE affecting our packages. For that, we are using the NVD, National Vulnerability Database, provided by the NIST, which lists all known CVEs. So we've improved the same PKG stat script to make a mapping and a matching against the build root packages that we have on one side, and the list of packages and software components known by the NVD database. And based on that, and the version affecting, uh, affected by different CVEs and the version currently packaged in Buildroot, we are able to determine if a given CVE is affecting one of your, our packages or not. Together with that, we've added a variable to our uh, package make files called package ignore CVEs, which allows a package to explicitly say, yes, I know there is this CVE in the NVD database, but I am not affected by it. Usually we are not affected by some CVEs because we fix them locally with a patch. So our version technically is still affected uh, when you compare it with the NVD database, but because we backported the security fix, this CVE is no longer affecting us. Um, this um, matching allows uh, build root to notify package maintainers when they are CVEs affecting their packages. So here is an example of the PKG stat output. We can see in the middle white uh, column uh, the current version of the package in build root. For example, a Ccache is in version uh, 379 in build root. And the, the next column uh, where it says found by distro is the information retrieved from releasemonitoring.org. So we can see release monitoring knows about Ccash also being in version 3.7.9, so there's nothing to do in terms of build root update. The next package, CCID, is a bit different. We have version 1.4.31 in build root, but uh, releasemonitoring.org knows about version 1.4.32, which is newer, so probably we should update that package. Uh, moving a little further down, the serial package is up to date with uh, the latest upstream version, but apparently, according to the NPD database, there are two CVEs from uh, 2020 that are reported against this package. So we should probably investigate that, uh, see if upstream has the appropriate vulnerability fixes. Um, around these 
uh, releasemonitoring.org uh, checks and CVE checks, we also wanted to improve the notifications sent to developers. A little bit like the Linux kernel as a maintainer's file, Buildroot has a developer's file which says which developer is responsible for which package or which dev config for a given platform or which CPU architecture. And we are already sending a notification to uh, Buildroot developers when there are failures related to their packages in our auto builders. And as part of the internship that was done last summer, we improved that notification to cover uh, more aspects. So we now notify developers about packages being not up to date, uh, about CVEs that are not fixed, about build failures of our dev configs in our GitLab uh, continuous integration, or about failures to run our runtime test in the same GitLab continuous integration infrastructure. This notification looks like this. For example, packages having a newer version. This is the information coming from releasemonitoring.org telling a contributor, okay, your pack, this package you're taking care of is no longer up to date with upstream. We have the same for uh, packages having CVEs, as can be seen at the bottom of that slide. Um, moving on, um, we also notify developers of failures of their dev configs. And so we can see here at the top of the slide a number of uh, dev configs for different platforms that apparently do not build and some failures in our runtime test as well which need to be uh, looked at by their maintainers. Um, another aspect that was improved as part of this internship is the search capability on autobuild.buildroot.org. So this is our autobuilder infrastructure which we use to uh, build 24-7 uh, random configurations. Uh, of Buildroot and report those results uh, in a central location, autobuild.buildroot.org. This has been in place for many years in the Buildroot community and has helped us detect and fix many, many dependency problems, version compatibility issue, tool chain problems, and many more. And so what we wanted to do is be able to query um, the database for things like, hey, can you tell me what are all the successful builds that had uh, BR2 package BuzzyBox enabled on ARM with Uselipsy? Because that kind of query is sometimes useful to understand uh, why a given failure is happening, since when it is happening, under what uh, conditions it is happening, and so on. And so our intern improved the, um, the search capabilities to, to make that sort of queries possible. We've done a number of other smaller improvements as well. Uh, we've added a make package diff config target for kconfig based packages. So the kconfig based packages are, for example, are the build package for Linux, for uBoot, for BuzzyBox, so all those packages that use the typical many config, X config configuration interface. And the make uh, Linux diff config target allows to calculate the difference between the currently stored configuration for Linux and the one you're actually using to build your Linux kernel. Indeed, when you run make Linux menu config, you can change the Linux kernel configuration, but it might diverge from the one you have stored. So this allows to calculate the difference and, and help you update your uh, Linux kernel configuration. We've added uh, support for generating root file system images in more format. We obviously already supported generating uh, ext4 file system images, squashfs, ubifs, and plenty more but we've added support for F2FS, ButterFS, and EROFS as well. Another nice contribution that we got was the addition of um, support for GetTextTiny as an alternative to the full-blown GNU GetText. So GetText is used for message translation mainly, and in a number of embedded systems, having message translation is not always necessary, but we still had to use the, the full-blown GNU GetText, which is quite long to build and has a certain footprint on the target. And there is a replacement project called GetTextTiny. So now we have the two as, as an alternative, uh, which is really nice to create more uh, lightweight embedded uh, Linux systems. So to conclude this talk, um, Beardroot is a very active project, uh, as you can see from both the activity of the community and the number of things that have evolved and improved over the past two years. We are now doing an LTS release uh, each year with a one-year maintenance window. Perhaps in the future we will extend that if we receive enough interest and, and contributions, but for now it's a one-year uh, duration. We've added support for new CPU architecture, new package infrastructures, we have Git caching, and we have uh, kept a lot of packages up to date and added uh, more than 400 packages. 
top level parallel build has made good progress. Uh, we've also made progress in the reproducible build effort. And most importantly, the maintenance tooling has been significantly improved. Overall, if you're interested in learning about build routes, I'm of course available in the chat following this talk. But I'm also going to teach a 16 hours online training to, to dive into build route. So if you're interested, it's going to take place online from July 28 to July uh, 31. And you can register online on the bootling.com website. Thanks a lot for your attention. And now if you have any question, I'm available in the chat to discuss anything related to build route with you. Thanks a lot and enjoy working with BuildRoot.